dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. It goes without saying that leadership's greatest problem doesn't come from outside conditions, but rather from working with people. From ourselves and our own inadequacies to the various ways that the people we work with can perform well or not, if we can learn how to master the human heart, everything else would fall into place. The good news is that's exactly what Christ came to do. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be back with you again. And let's go ahead and start with a prayer right off the bat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm just so impressed with our Lord's sense of his mission. And I know the urgency for us to incorporate that mission into our own. You know, so, so many times people t- tell me, Father, I wish I had a purposeful life. I wish I could do what I really want to do instead of just being successful at things I don't want to do. Especially if, for those who get to a certain level of success. You, you've made your money. You've sold your business. You've, you've learned so many things, but there can be an emptiness that gnaws deep inside of the heart of a successful person. That emptiness speaks to them actually that maybe they haven't been successful at the most important thing. You know, maybe they, even after doing everything that you do, you can still be left saying, I haven't accomplished what I came for. And when a Christian feels that way, it's especially tragic, right? Because of all the people on the earth, the ones who are supposed to be most fulfilled are the sons of God. You know, if we, if we really believe that we have the Lord Jesus Christ as our best friend and the Father as the end goal of our lives, it goes without saying that we really should be the most fulfilled of all people. And especially when you look at the Christian teaching that, in fact, everything that we do, we can fill with love. And when we do something full of love and full of grace, well, God is glorified by it and the world is made better by it. We, you'd almost say uh, the Christians should be at the masters of the art of fulfillment. So then we look around and we say, well, why aren't I? And I think to a great degree, we're not because we haven't allowed ourselves to accept that incredible, awesome dignity, which is ours. Namely, that everything that we do, we do as members of the body of Jesus Christ. And that everything that we do comes from him and is accomplished through him. And that his grace is at work in us. And that means that when we're in work in in the world, at work in the world, his grace at work in us spreads through us into this world. The more I can understand that, the more I can grasp my own dignity. And then it's not a question of looking for a different job, you know, becoming a priest, you know, becoming a deacon, uh, working outside, you know, doing something else. It, it's, it, in fact, it becomes a question of filling whatever we do with that spirit of God, that spirit of Jesus that has taken hold of us at our baptism when we became members of his body. Well, one good way to to deepen that is to look in the scriptures at everywhere that Christ said what he came to the earth to accomplish. 
I saw, you know, many different places where this was elucidated, some of them having up to 33 different reasons. And I wanted to focus in on the ones that our Lord himself mentions. And there's one in particular here that strikes me very much. It's in Mark chapter 2. That's when Christ speaks about how he came in order to call not the righteous, but sinners. And I think of this one in particular for you because you all came here because you wanted to become better Catholic business leaders. You wanted to do your business in a wet, better way. You wanted to, to grow in your ability to influence your business and looking for the way that faith can come into that to make you a more convincing purveyor of your own culture. I say that that's just really great, right? So we want to do that. And so most of you, by, by so doing, you know, we know we need to focus in on soft skills, on communication, on time management, on delegation, on how we work with people to communicate well across lines, how we can include them and bring out their better gifts, all those different skills. We know that those are very important. The last thing I thought you would probably understand or, or, or look for in, in a meeting like this is a talk about how Christ came to save sinners. Why? Because, well, for most of us, Christ coming to save sinners is a very religious type of thing. It doesn't have anything to do with who we are as leaders. Well, I want to give you a good word here. In fact, it has everything to do with who you are as leaders. Now, admittedly, there's a very religious element to it. Sin is the rejection of God by a voluntary act of which we have full knowledge and full consent. So when I know something is wrong and I willfully do it anyway, I become a sinner, meaning my action becomes one that is deviant and not only deviant, meaning it hurts whomever I act towards, but it, by so doing, when I do a deviant act willfully and with full knowledge, I end up hurting myself in the process. And so sin has a double damage. On the one hand, doing things that are bad hurts everyone around you. And when you do it willfully, it hurts you as well. And so we can understand that this is obviously stuff that is moral, it's ethical. It doesn't really have to place a place in the workplace. And I would say, yes, you're right to a degree, of course. But I want to enlarge in for a second your vision for what your workplace is all about. You see, the Catholic leader is not there just to run a business. If you were here just to run a business, I could preach to you and say to you, you know, you need to develop this and that uh, type of managerial skill, okay? Or this or that type of executive functionality. But I'm I'm convinced if a computer can do it or if a computer could replace you, it's not what is properly Christian. A Christian, in other words, in the workplace will manage differently and will lead their organization differently because our management techniques and our leadership skills are rooted in a different spirit, the spirit of Christ himself as he approaches what is to be done. It's not the what that changes, in other words, but the how. The what stays the same. I got to come in and unlock that building and I've got to rally a team and I've got to get them to give their best talents and I've got to get them to make sure the transactions are done in the way that's the most profitable and at the same time most equitable for everyone involved so that our business does a good business and makes a profit and we can all go home, you know, the wiser and our world the more peaceful and our bank accounts the fuller, right? So that's, that's great business. That's the what. Christ is not interested in the what, first of all. He's first of all interested in the why and the how. And that's where understanding his mission can give new life to your own. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org and subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. All right, so we're all looking together at Mark chapter 2. So you can go ahead and just open your Bibles there 
and take a look with me and read this passage because it's really astounding. Right at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus reveals why he came to this world. And it surprised those who heard it then, and I think it surprises us who hear it now at the same time. He says this. Do you remember the scene? It's Mark 2, verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, what's amazing to me is that this incredibly powerful ethical teaching, which is that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is here to save hearts that have voluntarily plunged themselves in deviancy, who have voluntarily done what is wrong, who knew what was wrong and did it anyway, that that incredibly powerful word spoken was spoken to a person in the midst of his professional life. Levi was called by Christ from his sin while he was sitting at his tax collector's post. Now, a tax collector in those days wasn't just anybody. He was someone that the, the occupying force, the Romans, would have chosen from the occupied people, the Jews, in order to do their bidding. So Levi had voluntarily left his own people in Israel in order to benefit by the use of the force and the strength of the occupying power, the Romans, from whatever that strength of the occupying power could give him. In other words, his job was to collect the taxes for the Romans from his own people, and he was allowed to keep whatever he could extort from them over and above what the Romans required them to collect. This means that Levi was a traitor of his people. He was lower than the low. He had turned against his own in order to make his own profit. And he had to be good at what he did. He had to obviously keep good track of the numbers because that's what he was doing. He was counting his coins and every bit that he could extort that was over and above, he could keep. And so you've got a man here sitting at his very post, collecting, collecting the taxes. And in the midst of that work, not outside of it, not in his family, not when he was kneeling down, when praying in the woods, with, you know, in a, a moment alone with his God, but instead in the midst of his profession and a profession that he was doing poorly, Christ came to find him. And I think this is a really profound insight for us that Jesus doesn't look at business and the work that we do as somehow being on the outside of our life. Almost like, hey, I'm a mechanic, you know, and that's what I do from nine to five and the rest of the time I'm a dad. And so God cares about me when I'm a dad and he doesn't care about me when I'm a mechanic. As if like almost what we do at the workplace we can allow the atheism, the practical atheism, and the secularism of our workplace environments where God is not really spoken of or mentioned, we can allow that to come into our own minds and we can act like that job that we're doing is somehow on the outside of who we are and on the outside of God's grace. We can. But if we do that, we'll also be denying a lot of what is found in sacred scripture. St. Paul identifies himself as a tent maker. Joseph, the father, foster father of Jesus, identified himself as a carpenter. Christ himself was known as the son of a carpenter. He called Simon Peter while he was fishing. He called himself a shepherd. And here he summons Matthew, Levi, from his tax collector's post. In other words, that world of business is not on the outside of Christ. It's very much something he pays attention to. In fact, I think that we who are in this world and are called by our professional lives to advance the culture are actually right in the front lines as the meeting point where Christ wants to meet our world. 
If I run a bank, for example, I can look at my life from the what and I could say, hey, I'm just doing this, exacting this commerce. And if I take that and just say, that's what I'm supposed to do and my heart and my ethics are on the outside of that, boy, did I ever make a mistake. Because if all I'm doing is something a machine could do and replace me with, well, then why am I even doing it? It's no wonder that you're not fulfilled. You're not fulfilled because you're not even doing the work. I mean, like you're doing the work on the outside. You're doing the work for, as someone who's just able to do a money, a financial transaction. But when you're, if you were to bring everything that you had from your family, from your past, your talents, your skills, your dreams, your religion, your faith, and you were to bring all that to bear with that same demands to perform the same transaction, it would be a transaction that would give life to you instead of one that felt like it was taking life away from you. You see, our, the difference between a Christian worker and a non-Christian worker isn't in what they do, it is in how they do it. And we are called not to work like those who don't know the Savior, but rather called to work like those who do. When he said, I came to call sinners, he begins by calling Levi a terrible sinner right there in his workplace. It's in that profession that he hears this call from Christ. Now, he leaves that profession behind because there's no way that you can sanctify extortion. You know, maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good way for us to look at it in our own lives. Are there things that we're doing in our own jobs that we just simply cannot sanctify? We have to stop. I mean, if I'm doing a corrupt business, it's time that I stop it. Harassment, uh, the, the, the mistreatment of those who are underneath me, all that kind of stuff. Uh, extorting a larger gain than is my due, hiking prices beyond what's equitable, all that stuff. You have to leave that behind. But I don't think Christ asked Matthew to leave behind the skill set that he was able to employ. He just needed to employ it for a higher purpose. It was no longer that he'd be counting coins, but at the same time, we know for a fact that the apostles needed the same skill set that Matthew had. They were given large sums of donations. As early as the very beginnings of the Acts of the Apostles, when Barnabas came and sold his lands and laid it at the feet of the apostles, who do you think it was who counted for that? How did they account for it correctly? How do they balance it out? When you see all the ways of St. Paul is very careful to be sure about his fundraising and that it be above board and without repute as he raised the funds for the churches to give to the church in Jerusalem when they were suffering from a famine. Just to mention any of them, all of the goods of the church, we need good accountants. We need people who are good with numbers. But Matthew, the point is that Matthew's heart was changed right then and there. How many times don't you think that our Lord comes knocking at the doors of our hearts as we face management problems, personnel problems, as we face the different things that can come our way, all the curveballs that we face every single day as an entrepreneur, as a self-made business person, as a, as a business owner in a small context? My goodness, you guys are absolutely amazing in what you have to do. You don't think that our Lord is with you in that? In fact, he is. He came to call sinners and he comes to call them outside of the workplace and he comes to call them right in what you and I experience every day. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. You know, when I read this gospel passage from Mark, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I can't help but think of all the different experiences that we have when we have to manage people. And, and the, the, the situations of brokenness that come in our own hearts to begin with. You know, you, can, you think that you're doing just fine until you have to manage someone who's, who's difficult for you. That person might be actually right. That person might actually be better than you. And yet, for some reason or another, they bring out the worst inside of you. It's amazing because at those moments, we can feel like such a failure. 
we can we can succumb to that temptation and become bad managers but to do it right and to nail it and to bring the best out of somebody well it requires that i overcome the sinfulness of my own heart my own judgmentalism my own shortness my own smallness of mind you know it's funny because we think that the problem is the people underneath us but sometimes the biggest problem is ourselves and our, our life and business can therefore lead us to despair. So, so many people, what they end up doing is they go into the business life and they separate the, their work life from their personal life, from their religious life on purpose. And it's because they just can't handle the fact that maybe they would be the big sinner that they are. <laughs> you know, I mean, when it comes right down to it, none of us want to feel like sinners. None of us want to acknowledge that we're not great or not the most perfect people that we all want to be. We all want to be someone different than what we are. It's, it's natural and human. And how beautiful for us at those exact moments of failure in our own management to be able to humble ourselves in front of Christ and say, you came not for the righteous, but for sinners. And therefore, I'm willing to try to be a better manager. I'm going to learn those skills. I'm going to figure out how to be, not by my own strength, but by your grace. The mercy of Christ comes exactly there to heal. Because if I can heal you and every time that you have to face a personnel conflict, a difficult situation, well, the healing of Christ can now come to combat the effects of sin right there in your workplace. I mean, when you've got a toxic environment on your team and you've got people picking on each other and people gossiping about each other and people backbiting about each other and people complaining about everything and issuing all kinds of negativity, we need a Christian right there. We need a Christian to come into that management realizing that, hey, you know what? The only thing that's going to get us out of this is the effort to overcome those different situations by the force of our will to win and be successful in our endeavor. And if we backbite and split up, we're not going to make it. And how do I get that hope in my heart that th that conversion is possible? Well, from my relationship with my God. He has given you that role as a manager in order that by managing those people for the best and creating that workplace culture for the best, you can bring something of the kingdom of God into the life of your workers. You have an incredible amount of power to do an incredible amount of good. Don't let it go to waste. You're a manager on purpose. And that purpose needs to be rooted in Christ. Even if you don't bring him into the conversations in a secular environment. I'm not talking about bringing Christ into conversations. I'm talking about bringing the spirit of Christ into the culture that you have. And that spirit can be brought, that Christ can be brought in his power, in and through you. And your hope-filled optimism to overcome in yourself the own obstacles that keep you from being that peacemaker and you from being that source of light. If Christ can convert you who are the manager, he'll be able to bring that peace into the workplace. Which is why we need to hear this line from Christ really practically applied in our life. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And firstly, apply it to ourselves. If I can do that, guess what? Well, then I, when I look at that same situation and I, I might have a good heart and I might have the right, but I look at this and I'm like, good gravy. These people are fighting. These people don't like each other. You know, it's amazing how, you know, you could have grown adults who are absolutely amazing at home. They're grandmothers at home, grandmothers, grandfathers. You bring them in the workplace environment, they become like little kids. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, not everybody, you know, not even maybe most, but it's amazing how some, it's like that we give, we give ourselves permission when we go to work to just act up. It's a strange thing. And we put all the burden on the shoulders of the leader to somehow or other, you know, save us from ourselves. It's a weird kind of situation we find ourselves in as management. And so if we looked, our, looked at that from a human point of view, we'd be just tempted to say, well, we just either have to quit just let the government take over our business. That would solve everything. You make all the pain go away. Or on the other hand, if we're going to stay, we're going to, you know, we're going to have to just fire these people because, and then you end up firing everybody. How can you find, you can't find enough good people to fill your spots. So now what are you going to do?
Well, the third option is that we just end up becoming mediocre and we allow this environment and that's not a good option either. Here's another solution. And that is that you look at those personality conflicts and you look at that lack of cooperation. You look at the selfishness that's present there as if you had the eyes of Christ who had overcome it all on the cross. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And I'm thinking of a, of a, of a guy I know who deliberately hires in people who have had, had difficulties, people that he knows this job is going to help because he looks at his management and his workplace environment as an opportunity to help people to become better people. Now, that's a pretty courageous workforce environment. He's a pretty courageous leader, but he's also a very devout Catholic who's taking that faith that he's gotten from the scriptures and that confidence he has in the saving power of Christ. And he's actually using his workforce in order to apply it in the lives of people who need it the most. Now, I'm not saying that you all have to do that, but I am saying to look at what you have been given from that optic. There is nothing happening on your teams and there's no employee whose problems and challenges are bigger than Christ. Jesus in the workplace and through your management and through the running of your companies, guess what he's doing? He's healing a broken world. And we have to have that audacity in our leadership rooted in Christ and in the power of his mercy and the power of his redemption to want to bring that into our workplace. That's why you've been given that company. That's why you've been given those people. It's in order to extend the mission of Christ and to seek and save what is lost. We hire the best of people, but all of them are going to be flawed because we're all flawed. Christ is the Savior, and through our business, He can work His salvation if we let Him. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.